to an historic radio program for you tonight with Jim Mars, Harry Cooper, and remote viewer Dick Allgaier. Well, this, this uh, remote viewing session really underscores the, uh, the truth of your book, the reality of, of the story that Don Angel reported to you. He didn't want to take that with him, obviously, and, and giving it to you was just an extraordinary uh, event. Uh, Jim, anything to pop in here? <coughs> Well, for Harry, I'd like to say that I wish I had the time and money to accompany you to Antarctica because I'd love to go down there and locate Agartha, <laughs> the Shangri-La that they yeah. talked about that they were preparing for the Fuhrer. We are, we are able, I think we are able to put this together extremely well. Um, there's things I can't divulge right now. Uh, I'm going over to Europe again to uh, next uh, about three, four weeks from now. Uh, but in addition, one of our members is a wonderful, wonderful guy, retired Captain U.S. Navy. He was the executive officer on the submarine that was down there. And I just got an email from him about an hour before airtime. Talks about a warm water lake that uh, they went into with the Senate, etc. So I have to go through it further. But, it, you know, it's just not all Harry Cooper doing this. Harry Cooper is oh. merely the, the glue that holds all these people together, and they all yeah. have a piece of the puzzle. And uh, it's just incredible when you start opening all the doors. This is nothing new. This is this goes back to 1938 when there was a huge German expedition that went down to Antarctica. I sent you that video, didn't I, Jim? You got it. Didn't I you? think so. Yeah, yeah you got to look where at they that. Planted all the flags. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, they show they, still it, pictures of some of these, and I mean gigantic caverns underground. They're just yeah. huge. Well, bear in mind, I went to that island off of Rio, about a thousand clicks out uh, in the uh, Atlantic, South Atlantic there, the island Trinidadie, not to be confused with Trinidad. And uh, this is where that expedition laid over for a while. That, uh, that island is owned by Brazil, and they've had a naval contingent oh. there forever. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. um, they... Uh, for, uh, their whole job is to uh, raise the flag in the morning and say we own 200 miles of fishing around here and retire the colors at night. It's not a military garrison like you would imagine, guns and stuff. No, it's, it's just people there and doing some experiments. So 1938, the Brazil Navy pulled all their people off the island, and one week later, the... Uh, the expedition under the flagship uh, Schwabenland arrived. They built. Look at my. Uh, look at the website sharkhunters.com and go to previous tours, and then click uh, Brazil. They uh, they built two 80 meter tall radio towers. I was in the remains of one of the radio shacks, and uh, then in 1941. The Germans pulled their people off. The Brazil Navy put their people back on. There's a little memorial. There, there's a picture of that little memorial. It's a handmade memorial, a painted rock with other painted rocks that spelled out 1941. Then in 1945, um, July, the Brazil Navy pulled their people off the island again, and a German contingent came down. This is three months after the war ended. One of the German sailors was killed in an accident, and we found this giant rock that had 717 painted on it, weathered all to heck, and we assumed that meant he was killed on the 17th of July. This island was instrumental because it just loaded with freshwater streams and creeks, and, and, and it had uh, uh, large herds of pigs and goats and wild turtles. So when a ship would come by on its way to Argentina, they could pull in there, refill their fresh water, and, uh, uh, okay, I almost used well, the word I used well, back so in, in the mafia days. They would clip a bunch of pigs <laughs> and uh, butcher them. I'm sorry, that's the word. And, yeah. and then continue. And the Germans were there at least two years after the war ended, we know for sure. Well, wow. hey, Harry, would that installation, wouldn't that have been a perfect uh, uh, retransmission station to transmit messages from Europe through there on into Antarctica? 
I can't imagine any other reason for them 80 meter tall uh, radio towers. Radio there's, pic yeah. there's pictures of them on my website too. Yeah, we've uh, seen we've seen uh, when we've been uh, on tour with Harry in the past on these expeditions. We've seen so many photographs, and they're all in the archives. You can find them all at SharkHunters.com too. Okay, let's uh, let's jump over to Dick now and tell us uh, what we're going to see on this really remarkable uh, documentary production that I was very honored to be able to participate in. Well, we see me describing the death in the bunker, someone actually getting shot. But if you want to see what goes through a remote viewer's mind, you can watch that clip, and something is not right about it. I keep saying that it's an act. It's a drama. I got the sense that someone was really killed, but... Um, it, something wasn't right about it. It was, it was play acting. It was a real death, but it was there as a staged thing, which makes sense. I also perceived that there was a delegation came. There was some meeting, people met, some agreement was made, and a leader was told, the guy in charge was told, well, you're going to do this. And he wasn't happy about it. So here's my question for Harry Cooper and for Jim Mars. If we believe that Hitler was allowed to escape, was he allowed or was he given safe passage? Was technology transferred? Was there a formal agreement? How did this happen? Was Did he just scoot away without the Allies knowing it? and then they they just agreed to not chase him or did did a delegation go and they made a formal face-to-face -face agreement in the middle of the war a Would trade for technology Berlin? trade for technology yeah, but, how did it work yeah but, yeah you how tell, did, uh, did they meet you face to were face a, a tv journalist because you asked about 43 questions there in one question <laughs> uh, according to don angel hitler and eva brown were forcibly drugged because Bormann wanted to keep the Reich alive, which he did, um, but he needed a figurehead. But once they got down to Argentina, he found uh, he didn't need Hitler, so Hitler was just allowed to live out his life quietly uh, in uh, Bariloche, which incidentally has been visited by four different presidents, American presidents during their presidency that we know of for sure, Eisenhower, Carter, Clinton, and uh, just recently, Mr. Potato. They, they might as well have gone to Antarctica. I mean, that's just out of the way. What's the reason that Eisenhower would have gone to Bariloche in, in uh, 54 or 60, whenever he went? 1960. 60. Yeah. So, um, according to Don Angel, uh, this is what happened. Now, we know that the only operating um, JU-390, the big six engine, the one they called the truck. We know it was at the uh, air base of Schweidnitz, which I think was on the border of uh, uh, Romania. Uh, it flew out and it went to um, Norway, which was the only part of the German forces that had not been conquered. And they were just the war was over, so they were just waiting for the Brits or the Americans or somebody to come and scoop them up, which took three months. And so the plane landed there. It was painted in uh, Swedish Air Force colors, light blue, and it flew down nonstop. This thing had an incredible range. Flew down nonstop and landed on a, uh, a road or on an estancia, a, a ranch, in Uruguay and was immediately disassembled and the parts all thrown away. Um, when I was there just this past February, we were interviewing a lot of old people that lived there, Germans, Germans. I don't speak Spanish, but I get along fine and with my German down there. And this lady was sitting there, older lady, she doesn't know anything. She heard about it, she doesn't know nothing, but no, there was no, there was no Nazis down here. And the lady had three swastikas tattooed on her forearm. So that's that's how that's how he got down there, and then he went to live in Bariloche, which is a beautiful place. 
but we can go, you know, we can use up another two whole hours on that. Yeah, on the cover of uh, Harry's book is a color photograph of the beautiful home, Bavarian style, built by the Mercedes family in Bariloche that yep, Hitler apparently that lived photo, in. And, uh, yeah. We, we, we got to thank uh, Jeff for helping uh, design that, that cover. Oh. Happy that's to do. Story of, that story of Don Angel telling about being on the U-boat with Martin Borman yep. was one of the best stories I've ever read. I read that book, and that is, that is just you know, about being in that cramped, stinky U-boat, and Don Angel didn't like being in U-boats, and Martin Borman was not a nice guy. It just, it, it, there are just touches in there that you, you can just tell it. He's telling that it's a real story. There's so much detail. It's a great story. <laughs> yeah, he, he uh, got along with Borman as, long, as much as he had to, but uh, like you say, Borman was was hard to get along with, and uh, that one that one exchange where where the captain of the U-boat got got angry with uh, with Don Angel and, and gave him a, an ass chewing, and then Borman stood him up and told and reminded him that uh, if he insulted uh, Don Angel again, it would be the same as insulting the leader of the Third Reich, which was Borman at that time, and and he said. Do I need to remind you of the consequences of insulting the Fuhrer? Wow. Which I, I think meant uh, Schutzky, Schutzky. Mm -hmm. yeah, Quite it a was, story. It was, it was an interesting book to uh, work on. I loved uh, every minute of it. And, and the thing I like about it most, it's absolutely accurate right on the button. Well, the scenario I can see that fits with everything we know, everything I know anyway, and with uh, Dick's remote viewing, is that Dick, the, the sequence you talked about where somebody who obviously knew Hitler and came to him, and I don't think he used the term whisper in his ear, but he was there and they had a private conversation. And that was ca apparently kind of the turning point. That's why in your remote viewing, I think you turned to that. I, in my scenario, I would say that was Borman. Uh, his chief of staff who you know had full access to him in fact that's how he got to be so powerful is that acting as chief of staff it was Bormann who could decide who talked to Hitler and who didn't and what oh, yes. he told Hitler and what they didn't and he was pretty well running the show especially uh, after uh, the summer of uh, 44 but I think it was Bormann who had made a deal at the highest levels of international banking and commerce, who then stepped to Hitler in a private conversation and said, Mein Fuhrer, you know, I'm sorry, but we're going to lose the war. And I think you need to start making preparations to leave. And Hitler probably said, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go down with the ship. And that's probably when Morton Borman decided, well, we'll just whisk him out of here, drug him, and take him anyway. And uh, I think the deal was cut at that level between the, uh, the uh, possibly through Alan Dulles, possibly through John J. McCloy, who was CEO of City, National <laughs> City Bank in the 30s, and they were the largest lenders of money to the Nazi mm. government, and, I, and, I, and good friends uh, with uh, the uh, head of uh, ABS, head of the German Central Bank, and uh, I think that at that level, they said, okay, look, the war's going to be gone. Uh, let, let's, let's carve up Germany. Uh, we'll all get our fingers in the pie. And America needs, uh, we need the, the uh, nuclear technology so we can end the war with Japan. And uh, I think that's where the deal was cut. And, and they would tell Hitler, look, if you don't do this, uh, all of Germany is going to be a wasteland. And uh, you have to do it, mein Führer. And I think that's what turned him. He felt betrayed. He felt bitter. And the thing that stuck with me, Dick, is when you said he knew he had to do this. He didn't want to do it, but he had to do it. Okay? So obviously there was extreme leverage on him. And I think that was it. It was either you go along with this or your beloved Germany will be totally destroyed. And it damn near was, but uh, yeah. Well, Very interesting. Devastated, but it sure sprang back well. Yeah, well, you said something. <laughs> Harry Cooper said something. He said, make, here's this man, make Germany great again. 
Sounds like a familiar political statement, doesn't it? <laughs> it does, yeah. Hey, yeah. What yeah. goes yeah. around comes around. <laughs> when we look at the, uh, the bird expedition known as ha Operation High Jump, High Jump and yeah. then we look at that uh, film I finally found and got to you, and I also sent it to Jim, the 1938-39 uh, German expedition to Antarctica, and you look at some of the still pictures in there of these gigantic underground, not under the snow and ice, underground caverns. I mean, these things are huge. And you think about that, and you know what thought came to me, Harry? What the thought was, wow, and then what didn't they show us that they found <laughs> down there? Yeah. And uh, we have, um, you know, we've been told that it's very difficult to get, uh, uh, you know, get to places we need down there. But as you know, uh, uh, in, in my understanding of the German language, uh, yeah. Ein Gang Verboten means Harry's welcome here. That's right. But we have already gotten <laughs> the green light from several of the governing agencies down there so we're, we're not going to have any problem with the authorities we're not going to have to outrun the police uh, we've been promised cooperation from several of these entities and uh, we've got stuff that I you know I can't even mention just yet right if uh, also if anybody out there is listening who knows anyone who was involved with operation high jump and there's some of those men are still alive. There are about 5,000 plus of them uh, in Admiral Byrd's uh, transports and his aircraft carrier and all that. They went down there and they met a very unpleasant welcome. And Operation High Jump, look it up, do your research, folks. It's uh, we, he, Admiral Byrd got his his uh, his his tail kicked uh, and yeah. he left. Uh, something's down there, uh, and I'm not sure that Harry Cooper will be able to find that, but he's going looking, and it may be time that that be uh, investigated fully. When you look at that film, I'll, I'll, I should post it again, and look at the caverns there that are wet, completely weather-resistant. There are no icebergs inside these caverns, no frozen. They're habitable, and what could have been built there from 1938-39 to 1944-45. Uh, they could have sent a whole lot of transport ships down there with a whole lot of building material and done some remarkable things. All right, we got to wrap this up. Uh, Dick, what do you want to add here uh, as a, a final word or two? If I can point you again yeah. to the top of rents.com, we're talking about the uh, poster of the documentary. You see right there what happened, what really happened to Adolf Hitler remote viewing the death of the Fuhrer. Yeah, I, I think it's one of the best remote viewing documentaries that honestly shows uh, real remote viewing. It's uh, Jeff Rents helped write it and produce it. He's the narrator. And anything is good with Jim Mars uh, in it, and Jim Mars providing commentary. The link is there, and I think it's worth watching. And it's it's just been so interesting to get feedback as a remote viewer you often crave feedback because you stand there and you don't know. I don't know why I wrote nuclear stuff. I don't know why I drew a guy anonymously buried in a, you know. And it, it's interesting for me to hear it from the guy who knows, and that's Harry Cooper. So it's been an interesting show. Thank you so much, guys, for helping out. You got it. Uh, Harry, anything you want to add here? This is, uh, this is really an extraordinary subject. Uh, and I think... Uh, we are now uh, getting further confirmation of your uh, long and dedicated work to bring historical truth to all of us. It's been an interesting uh, evening for me. I learned a lot, and uh, I think shows like this where you have several people like like uh, Dick and Jim and myself to get point counterpoint and and to uh, embellish and and to reinforce what each person has learned. I think you, this is one of your better shows. Well, it, it's, it's great because of you folks. And uh, James, uh, you've been watching this, this story, as it were, for a lot of years. This, yep. uh, this all, like the JFK, with the reverse speech, it all, it all kind of gels. It all flows right. together. 
and it substantiates my little motto, okay, which is basically none of us are as smart as all of us.